Um, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you Martin Cooper of ArrayCom, and he's a chairman, CEO, and co-founder of that organization. has has been around Motorola, and um, he's left a host of enemies in in route. Please welcome Marty Cooper. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I can't stay, but you you got them. You pass the plate afterwards before. because they don't give willingly. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, uh, Congressman Honda and uh, Senator Burns. Uh, I, I can't tell you how privileged I am and how I, I'm honored I am to uh, be uh, invited here, and I'm especially privileged since uh, both uh, Congressman uh, Honda and Senator Burns remember my name. Uh, and, uh, not everybody has that uh, talent. We've got a minister in our town, uh, I live in Del Mar, California, who can't remember a name for the life of him. And he came up with a trick. His trick was he'd, every time he had an event where he had to remember people's name, he'd write the names down on a piece of paper and he'd pin it on the inside of his coat. And so last Sunday, uh, we have this meeting and he announces, uh, we're here today uh, to wish uh, our good friends, George Sweeney and his lovely wife, Linda, as they go off into a new adventure in Chicago uh, with their lovely children, Johnny and Lydia. And we give them our blessings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to talk about two uh, related issues today that I think are going to have a profound effect on every one of the people in this room and in fact on every person uh, in the world ultimately. The first issue is the internet uh, and the second one is the management of the radio frequency spectrum. Now these things mean different things to different people uh, and uh, I suspect that all of you have been exposed to lots of different meanings of this thing but I want you to know that I'm here uh, with a uh, new religion in this area. I had occasion several months ago to talk to the Minister of Communications uh, of China also a great honor. Uh, and he asked me, since I'm supposed to be an expert on wireless, uh, what's 3G? And I said, well, 3G is this new broadband uh, uh, wireless communication system that uses wideband CDMA and packet switching. And he smiled at me uh, with uh, what could only, I could only describe in a stereotypical way, this inscrutable look and said, yes, Mr. Cooper, but what is 3G? So I said, well, 3G is a way to get voice and data communications on a cellular system. And he, once again, he smiled at me and said, yes, Mr. Cooper, I understand that, but what is 3G? And then it finally came through, and I, and I understood. Because I am one of those who has spent my life obfuscating the real issues with technobabble with scientific wordplay, when all that's really important to people is what effect are these things going to have on their lives, and that's what we should be talking about. Not acronyms, not technology, but what is it, what's going to change? What are we going to do differently? How are we going to live differently? So let's talk about uh, these issues, and I hope that I can do that without talking about uh, technology, because I think that the Internet has the potential to make a whole host of new applications available that make people more productive, that make their lives more convenient, that make them safer, that entertain them, that allow them to play games, that educate them. But saying that the internet can do all these things is like saying that a hammer and a saw can build a house. Because you know that can happen. Only in the hands of skilled people using the right raw materials can these tools actually create a house. And only with creative people, talented people, delivering applications that serves the needs of people. And I mean all people, not just a limited number of people. Only uh, under those conditions will the internet achieve its potential. It, that's the only context that the words broadband or packet switching or CDMA, or all of these other uh, acronyms, 
too numerous to mention. That's the only way that they can develop any meaning. Well, how are people going to change? So I want to share with you uh, my vision of what the Internet uh, can be 10 years from now. Uh, but I warn you that I'm not going to uh, play word games because I think this vision can only happen if the environment is right. And it is the awesome responsibility of the U.S. Congress and I want you to know that I uh, have been spending a lot of time leaning on whoever I can listen to, and, and Representative Honda will uh, tell you that I've uh, already leaned on him once today. The Congress has to create the right environment. They gotta rescue the vision of the internet from the people that would fence it in, would cage it into a historical anomaly. So I, I wanna start with a bit of history. Let's talk about cellular for a minute. When we, when we conceived of cellular some 30 years ago, we conceived of a new service, a telephone service that would unleash people from the connection to their wall, from their desk, allow them to roam wherever the action is, gave them the freedom to be anywhere, to be reached when they wanted to be reached, and to reach other people uh, as well. Well, uh, history has proved that that uh, vision is, uh, was a correct vision. People want that, people need it. We haven't finished the job yet. There, most of you still do most of your phone calls on a wired phone. That's gonna change as soon as we in the industry uh, get our act really together. A cellular will work as well as a wired phone and it, it will cost about the same or less than a wired phone, in which case there will be no reason at all for you to make a personal phone call on anything other than your personal telephone. But today, voice is the primary product of the cellular industry. It's the only product that really generates significant revenues uh, in the world. Enter the internet. Now the internet, historically, was designed to be a communication system among scientists. It was the way scientists were going to transfer huge amounts of data with uh, space not being an issue. And then came email, which to some of us is a scourge, to others uh, a blessing. Depends on your viewpoint. And then the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web offered access to vast amounts uh, of data, virtually uh, instantaneous, at least uh, theoretically. And that has changed our world irreversibly and profoundly. There are some industries today that are on the verge of revolution, others on the verge of extinction as a result of what the internet is, is bringing to us. A lot of those industries don't publicly admit it. Some of them don't even recognize it yet. But let me tell you, uh, they are going to change, and I'm going to talk about those uh, in a little bit. Uh, they are going to adapt, or they will perish and others are going to take their place. But the internet today is caged, it's constrained. The, the lessons that we learned 30 years ago about voice communications apply in spades to the internet. There are today in the US 115 million people that access the internet. Would you believe that about 80% of those people plod through the internet at 30 kilobits per second. Now you say, maybe that's all they need. No, you can't believe that. You can't believe that somebody reading a book, for example, can read a page and then try to turn that page and have to wait 20 or 30 seconds for the next page to appear. People would have a lot of trouble reading books, and yet that's the experience that you have on the internet today. You spend all kinds of time waiting for stuff to download. Uh, the, the people that operate on the internet at 30 kilobits per second, at dial-up speeds, who have to wait to dial up in the first place, are benefiting from a tiny percentage of what the internet can uh, deliver. What should the internet be? Well, the internet uh, is a host of applications that can be delivered to people at prices they can afford. I can't overemphasize the issue of cost because cost is going to be the fundamental element that lets us bring the internet to, to everybody. The internet is thirsty young minds 
flipping through web pages as fast as they can absorb, not stuck with a computer plugged into a wall, but wherever they want to be, whether it's sitting on the porch with their family or sitting in the, in the uh, uh, park or waiting in line for something to happen in these interminable lines that we have uh, lately. The internet is an elderly person or a heart patient or maybe just anybody who is, gets sick and wants to do a doctor visit not when they can get an appointment but while they are still sick and the internet does have the capability of delivering huge amounts of data instantaneously from a person. We know how to measure all those things, all the vital functions of a person's body. And we can deliver those things to a doctor. The doctor can do a diagnosis, and the person who is sick can see the doctor's face in real time as the doctor prescribes a solution to that particular problem. The internet is music delivery. Forget about CDs. The internet is picture taking. Who ever thought that you could have an a industry that depended upon film or upon transferring pictures from a digital camera to a computer? The internet is game playing in real time with people playing games with each other where space is not uh, an issue. The internet is shopping and it's a hundred other applications. They're all done with whatever speed is needed and with the freedom to move, the freedom to be anywhere. And an internet that can adapt to such a wide variety of application can, with just a flip of a software switch, that internet can be dedicated to emergency services in the event of a catastrophe. It's a huge issue. Why? It, it turns out that as we have discovered in virtually every catastrophe that's happened, whether you take the, the most extreme one was 9-11, but a situation like Columbine uh, in, in uh, Colorado. When you have a catastrophe, the, all the communication systems fail. The public switch network fails because everybody's trying to make phone calls uh, and nobody can get through. Same with the cellular systems. Would you believe that the local police can't talk to the state police, can't talk to the county police, can't talk to the FBI, can't talk to the other federal people, and all of their systems collapse? Why? Impossible to build a system in every location of the country that will serve all uh, of the possible emergencies that can happen. But suppose that you could, again, with the flip of the software switch, take a commercial system that's providing a whole bunch of consumer services and make that whole system available for emergency services. It is that kind of a thing that the concept of, of the internet properly executed uh, allows us to do. Now, that the, uh, how far are we f away from having uh, execution of a vision like that? Certainly, the systems that exist today, the systems that were designed to deliver voice and which still are essential, they're still growing, they're still important, but they will not do the job of the internet. They don't have the technical attributes. They don't have the business attribute. They don't have this attribute of inviting lots of different kinds of, of applications. Now, they're suitable for high mobility, they let you drive at 65 miles an hour and conduct a telephone conversation. That's important. Uh, but they cost too much. It, uh, just to take an example, to, to download a, a picture uh, on a uh, existing kind of cellular system that could cost the order of, of 50 cents or a dollar uh, and uh, it, it, the kinds of system that I am suggesting would let you download a picture for a fraction of a penny. That's the kind of thing that will revolutionize uh, our industry. So what's the catch? There always is one. Uh, if we're going to have the freedom to move, and the freedom to move is an essential attribute of this vision of the Internet uh, of the future, uh, it's got to be wireless. And if it's wireless, it needs spectrum. And we are repeatedly told there's not enough spectrum. You've all heard that story, right? Spectrum is like beachfront property. There's a scarcity. Uh, we'll uh, never have enough. And of course, I don't agree with that. I believe that there's plenty of spectrum. And that's where the Congress comes in. In the landmobile industry, in the personal communication industry, 
the technologists have doubled the ability of the spectrum to accommodate communications every two and a half years for the past 105 years. That's as long as we've had radio, for 105 years. And every two and a half years, on the average, they've doubled that uh, ability to carry uh, uh, voice conversations. And they will keep doing that. We haven't finished yet. The technologists can see, at least for the foreseeable future, that we can continue to double that spectrum every few years as long as we use the spectrum efficiently, wisely, as long as public policy allows, uh, it requires that people use the spectrum more efficiently. But if public policy lets service providers buy spectrum and use it in the same old way, if there's no incentive to use the spectrum better, then I guess we will run out of spectrum. I guess it, in that case, spectrum will be like beachfront property. But there are things that the government can do to stimulate effective use of the spectrum, to encourage people to use this, maybe to require people to use the spectrum better. Here are the things that I tell the, the congressmen that uh, were, are nice enough to let me talk to them, the kind of things that they ought to do. The Congress establishes spectrum policy. And if they establish spectrum policy that stimulates efficient use of the uh, radio frequency spectrum, that allocates spectrum to those entities, to those services that use the spectrum effectively, they will continue to improve the use of the spectrum. The only way historically that the technologists have improved the use of the spectrum is when there was no alternative. They couldn't get other spectrum. Or when the government said, as they did with cellular, we'll give you the spectrum, but you must come up with a way of using the spectrum much, much better than you have in the past. So that's the first new policy for effective use of the spectrum. The Congress has to establish policy that encourages new technology, new applications, new devices that focus on making people's lives better. And I mean all people. We haven't done an extraordinary job uh, in communications uh, in the past because what happens is you perform a, a useful ta a task, an important one, a and cellular does that today. It serves people extraordinarily well, albeit with a job not finished, but the people who are executing cellular would like to say, uh, that's the end. We don't need anything more. That's not the case. There are new technologies evolving. There are new applications evolving. Somehow or other, the Congress has to create a policy that lets people enter into the spectrum, acquire uh, elements of spectrum that uh, follow new rules uh, and that use the spectrum more effectively. The final thing that I would suggest that the Congress can do uh, is to support the efforts of the FCC to do uh, long-range planning. They do have a, a, a program in that regard. The, the history of spectrum planning has been totally reactive. When people need spectrum, they do a lot of lobbying, they come and ask for it, the uh, government does a, a lot of careful consideration, uh, and by no means am I critical uh, of that process, because it's not an easy process, but then they solve that problem. Somebody has got to look at the long range to think about all of the different things that are going to happen in the future, about what can happen if you stimulate new technology to make the use of the spectrum better, uh, and do some put every spectrum decision in the context of a long-range plan. So what I'm urging the Congress to do with regard to this most valuable uh, of our national resources, the radio spectrum, take your time. Do it right. The telecommunications industry uh, is today, believe it or not, still in its infancy, but it is about to blossom out. The engines of that blossoming are going to be, first of all, a new business attitude that focuses on the customer, an open platform that allows different kinds of applications because we've lived in an environment for 100 years with one application, voice. Now we're going to have hundreds. We have to change the way we're doing business. 
we have to look at new technologies that multiply the ability to use the spectrum, not just add percentage of, of increments. And we need a public policy that makes the spectrum available to those who use it well and who continue to improve the way that they use the spectrum. All these things that I talked to you about today, the vision of the internet, the new public policies that are required, none of those things are gonna happen very quickly. They are disruptive changes. Disruptive changes always take longer. But we are gonna see major changes in our industry in the next 10 years. Don't say that I didn't warn you. Thank you very much. I know Mr. Cooper is pressed for time, um, but he's agreed to answer a few questions from the, uh, from the audience. If, if anyone has any questions, Mr. Cooper. I think there's a, a little bit of an odor of a perpetual motion machine about some of the... I think of the last time we had somebody come to D.C., it was really called Media Fusion, I believe, that promised to solve all our broadband problems using the, uh, the energy grid, and it didn't pan out. What I'm curious about are who loses with this technology? Is it a completely a win-win, everything is going to be solved technology? I mean, where, where does this spectrum come from? It, does it come from just using incumbent spectrum more efficiently in a way that they win? Uh, there's some little piece here that I, I, I'm not getting. I'm sure it's there, but just reading the material, and I haven't read all of it, I don't quite understand how you've been able to do what it seems like nobody else has been able to do. I mean, where, where exactly is this spectrum going to come from that's going to allow you to do, solve the last mile problem with the low cost, high, high, high bandwidth service? I just well, don't know this, this is not a show. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get to the, uh, this is the microphone so you can hear me. Uh, did everybody hear the question? Uh, uh, where, where's all this spectrum coming from? Uh, by the way, I, I, Hundred years, I, Senator Burns. I suggested I have white hair, but uh, this uh, spectrum uh, multiplication has been going on for a hundred years. This is not something that, that we just created. And, and what has allowed us to get more out of the spectrum? Let me tell you. Uh, number one, uh, we're using more of the spectrum than we have ever. When Marconi did his first uh, uh, communication 105 years ago, he literally used the whole radio spectrum, the thing called the spark gap transmitter, used the whole radio spectrum. He broadcast over the whole world. Uh, you could have one conversation in the world. If you try to do a second one, it would interfere. We figured out, we have figured out how, first of all, to divide the spectrum up into channels. And you're all familiar with the concept of radio. That lets you get, uh, multiply the use of the spectrum by some number. Uh, we've learned how to use coding on these different channels, uh, things like AM and FM and so forth, and that gave us a little uh, improvement instead of using dots and dashes like uh, Marconi did. But the biggest thing that we did from the days of Marconi is using a, a thing called spatial diversity. So whereas Marconi made a conversation that took, that occupied the spectrum over the whole world, we learned how to transmit only over a continent so that you could hold a conversation in the US and one in Europe and one in Asia all at the same time. That, what I just said, tripled the use of the spectrum. And then we got to the point where you could do it in countries and states and cities, and then cellular came along, and we could reuse the spectrum within a city 20 or 30 times. We are now learning how to go to the next generation beyond that and reuse the spectrum literally in an, a, a space this big. We can now create a personal cell that is yours while you're using as much of the spectrum as you need, and, then, and, you, and it follows you around as you move places. And when you're finished with it, we tear it down and create another cell for somebody else. When you do that now, think about it. You now can reuse the spectrum over and over and over again, and it is that reuse that multiplies the uh, value of, of the spectrum. And no, there are no losers in that. Now you can say, well, boy, does that sound expensive? Yeah, it turns out that when we started uh, Arraycom, by the way, Arraycom's not the only company doing this. There are a lot of companies uh, in, in the business now. This technology, uh, believe it or not, is, is well known. Uh, the fact that the um, uh, major uh, carriers are not using it 
uh, is one of the travesties of uh, histories, but they will. They will uh, adopt this uh, uh, technology. But when we started at Raycom 10 years ago, there were no computers available in the world that could accomplish the kind of processing that we have to do to make these personal cells. Uh, it's now 10 years later. The, what was a Cray computer then, we can now buy as a chipset that we buy from Motorola or Texas Instruments for $115. Uh, and, and that kind of thing exists today. What I described to you, this personal cell concept, uh, is uh, embedded in 100,000 base stations throughout Southeast Asia, works gangbusters. They've got tons of spectrum w when they use that. So forgive me for such a long answer, but I am eternally grateful for you to, for having asked the question. I actually, I'm not familiar with that specific concept, but a spectrum common, and my assumption is we're talking about everybody having access to the spectrum all the time. Uh, and so that's the vision uh, that I talk about when I talk to people who uh, I'm not worried about thinking I'm really a kook, uh, because uh, we already know today how to divide up all of the spectrum, not by allocating hunks of spectrum to people, but letting people use whatever piece of the spectrum geographically, spectrum-wise, time-wise, when they need it. Why, why would you want to give uh, the Forest Service, as an example, a hunk of spectrum in the middle of New York City? Why? Because they need spectrum. Nobody argues with that. And so we give them a nationwide spectrum allocation. Uh, it is, we technically can already envision systems today that would allow uh, the entire spectrum to be available to everybody. And people can use whatever part of the spectrum that most effectively serves their needs when they need it uh, and give it up when they're finished with it and let somebody else use it. That concept alone would multiply the effectiveness of, of the spectrum irrespective of anything else uh, by uh, at least a, a one or two orders of, of magnitude. That is so far in the future, it's so politically uh, impossible that I don't even like to talk about it, but once again, I... I uh, but generally you support the idea. Uh, long, long term. Long term. I only support practical ideas. Uh, but long term. Long term. Uh, yeah. Well, I think that's what we're going to have to do. Both of these questions is, you know, Leslie was talking about unlicensed spectrum. So I would infer from your answer to these two questions that for for your technology, you're talking about doing this on unlicensed spectrum, the way Metricom did? And if not, where, where, well, what specific changes to spectrum policy do you need to realize your vision? Uh, the question is, uh, I promote the uh, use of unlicensed spectrum for the kinds of things I'm talking about. First of all, uh, my suggestions uh, about uh, using the spectrum more effectively apply to everything. I don't care whether it's licensed or not. Uh, the spectrum's there, it's a valuable resource, uh, the fundamental resource doesn't get renewed. It's a question of how effectively we use it. Everybody uh, ought to only use the part of the spectrum, the way I just described this lady, uh, that, that they need, and, and today spatial uh, is the way to do it. Uh, but the only way to put a practical system up today, in, in my humble judgment, is, is with licensed spectrum. Why? Uh, you have to defend yourself from the rest of the world. And, and licensing gives you that opportunity. It gives you the opportunity to know that you can predict the kind of service that you can offer to somebody uh, in the sense of having enough capacity and in the sense, uh, in the sense of uh, defending yourself from people that may I interfere with you. And, and so, no, I do not uh, advocate uh, unlicensed uh, spectrum. I know uh, somebody may want to ask me about uh, Wi-Fi, and I would love to answer that, but I, uh, there, there are services that are uh, useful uh, in an unlicensed form, uh, but I'm not uh, proposing that for predictable services. So what change in spectrum policy do you need? I'm sorry. What, what change in spectrum policy do you need then to, you know, to get to this? Uh, we need a policy, first of all, that is uh, agnostic with respect to technology. As an example, uh, 
the, the uh, policy for cellular spectrum today is, is almost totally focused on frequency division duplex. That is to say, uh, the way cellular works today, I don't know if you're all familiar with how your cell phones work, I know uh, most of you are, but when you talk, you talk on one radio channel, uh, and when you listen, you listen on another radio channel that may be 50 megahertz uh, separated from that. And when we created cellular 30 years ago, that was the way to do it. Well, things have changed in 30 years. I mean, uh, uh, we didn't, there were no integrated circuits, would you believe, when, when we started out with this thing. So uh, we know now how to do things with uh, time division duplex, doing the, uh, transmitting and receiving on a single channel. Uh, and it turns out the combination of time division duplex uh, and smart antennas uh, turns, uh, is extraordinarily valuable. So we look for agnostic, I'm not suggesting we throw frequency division duplex out, but somehow the spectrum policy has to make it uh, possible for new technologies to uh, get it, fit into the uh, spectrum. That's one example. Now, the second one is somehow or other the uh, auction process uh, has to be adjusted so that uh, th there is the opportunity for new ways of doing things, th things to be adopted. Uh, if in fact the only way that you can ever build a new technology or a new system is to have a ton of money, like billions of dollars, and then how are we ever going to do anything new? And so there has to be a policy that in, invites innovation uh, and uh, uh, that looks to new things for the public. It focuses not on uh, technology, but on what the needs of the people are. Well, that gentleman in your Uh, I don't know, you, you've all heard the question about the, the common thing. I, I don't want to get hung up on the, on the common thing. Uh, so I'm going to give you, a, a, I hope you'll forgive me, a very general answer. Uh, I have ultimate confidence in uh, technology. The, the, all of these problems you hear about, the, uh, the problems of security, you know they're going to get solved. Uh, the, the problems of interference are going to get solved one way or another. It just takes time. Uh, but but I, uh, the reason I don't want to get into the common thing is I really do think that's the next generation something. The, the uh, world it, it just is not ready uh, to just abandon the principles uh, of, uh, of 50 or 60 or 100 years of telecommunications and do something entirely different. And so I don't have that many years left to battle things. I'm going to fight battles that I, that I know I can win. So. This may be on the same level as that. Maybe, I don't know, but I'll, I'll pass you. The Navy has been doing studies now for about 20 years. How they are, are seeking out a lower uh, entity in the spectrum between human beings and uh, the, the, the pickup absorption between human beings and the communications that are brought between human beings. And it's, it's on, a, on a, a different level of spectrum. Now, uh, because it doesn't burn off so much heat and because it doesn't have uh, the abnormalities of a cell phone, they found that it might be more useful to be able to find out where that spectrum specifically is so that we can apply it to uh, uh, a non-radiated uh, uh, factor that we have in our cell phones now concerning the intake of the, the absorption level. Do you see anything in your crystal ball over that? Uh, 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 if you know all of the technology behind something, some new idea, and if it's very clear and it works in the laboratory uh, and, and all the answers are there, you're 10 years away. If you've got to start out the question as you just did about, see, we've got this inkling that there may be something there, oh, holy smoke. I mean, uh, it, it, not, not in our uh, lifetime. So. That's just a projection. I hate to be negative. The science fiction writers can write about stuff like that, yeah, but I certainly don't have to worry about it in my career.
I think we have time for one more question. Um, well, you pick it. Uh, uh, I, I'll, right, right here, sorry. Uh, reallocation of spectrum, do you think uh, we need to reallocate the spectrum that it's already been Reallocate the spectrum. Uh, that's, that, that is the hardest question of all, and Mike Calabrese can, can work on that along with, with other people. But there are some travesties in every segment of the spectrum of people using the spectrum so inefficiently, comparative stuff that we absolutely know about, uh, that it's a heartbreak. So uh, should we, if, if we really believe that ultimately the spectrum can make all our lives better, can make us more productive, can make us happier. Uh, shouldn't we be uh, refarming the spectrum? Uh, and, and our efforts to do that, uh, my, my, my guys in Washington are gonna uh, really be mad at me, but they are, they are uh, pitiful. I mean, take, take a look at, uh, should I not talk about broadcast spectrum? <laughs> You know, we're, we're using the, uh, and I'm not picking on the broadcasters, and, and they know that, uh, but the, we're using the broadcast spectrum today, and by the way, they're not the worst by any means, uh, but the, uh, we're using the broadcast spectrum today with the rules that were established 60 or 70 years ago, uh, and, uh, and look at it, and by the way, in the last 50 years, uh, uh, for those of you that aren't real quick on mathematics, for the last 50 years, we've improved two-way wireless communications by a million times. And, and for the last 60 or 70 years, the, the broadcast industry has been using the same standard. And if you think about when HDTV really happens, which means that you got one and, and your neighbor has one, uh, I can't conceive that will happen in, in less than another 10 years. And maybe it'll take longer. And I guarantee you, from the viewpoint of a technologist, that when that happens, it will be obsolete. We will, by, by that time, I guarantee you, we will know how to improve broadcast spectrum by at least another 10 or 20 times. So it's a huge problem, and I'm working on things that I can get my arms around. So thank you very much. You've all been wonderful. Thank you all very much.